Hi, everybody. Welcome to our master class on unschooling to university. So we're going to talk tonight about how children learn without school and without homeschooling. So hang on. Um, I have a whole lot of slides here and I'm not going to show you all the slides because we want to get done in an hour. But <laughs> so I'm going to skip over a few, but that's OK. OK. Um, this is me. I'm Judy Arnell. I am a certified brain and child development person, and um, I teach for several health organizations. So um, this is me. I just come on at the beginning to show you what I look like, but I, I'm just from in from a bike ride, so I'm really sweaty. <laughs> but that's me. Okay, now I'm going to stop my video so I can concentrate. Alrighty, so I have written several books on non-punitive parenting and education. And these are the books. They're on um, parenting without punishment ever. And that was fun. And then they got translated into different languages. And then I started up a nonprofit called unschoolingcanada.ca. We have lots on our website, so feel free to look at what we have on there. And I also wrote a book on non-punitive education called Unschooling to University. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. And welcome. So just want to get out there that we, we love teachers. I think um, teachers are doing the best with what they can do. And we love learning. We are not anti-education. But we have found that the system is not effective for a lot of our children. Okay, so what is the problem out there? What do children bring to school? All these wonderful things on the left-hand side, and when do they lose it? What happens to their engagement between the ages of five and 15? When at five, they're so curious and love to learn. That, that's all they do all day is learn. But then at 15, they, something happens to their engagement. The worldwide high school dropout rate is anywhere from 20 to 80%. And that is a very sad statistic. So what's the solution to that? The key to having engaged thinkers and learners is self-directed education. Now, we're not always talking about self-taught. It can be self-taught but the whole procurement of education should be self-directed. And when you look at little babies and toddlers, they are really good at teaching themselves so much. And that can't change. When they're young adults, they can teach themselves a lot of things too. We just have to get out of their way. So content is at our children's fingertips but we need alternate methodologies of delivery. So education today is more than reading, writing, and arithmetic. Although those are the three tools that children basically need to know in order to learn everything else. Um, and the thing too, reading, writing, and arithmetic is value-free pretty well. So once kids know how to read, once they know how to write, and once they know how to do basic math, that is a window into learning anything else they want to learn. So if you look at children today, when they're born, they love to play. <laughs> they learn. They educate themselves. That's how they learn is through play. And at the age of five or six years old, we say to them, I'm sorry, you've reached a new birthday and you can't play anymore. You have to go to this place called school for the rest of your childhood. And we take them off that learning agenda through play and we put them on a new track called school where they have to learn somebody else's agenda. Not what they want to learn. They have to learn what the government tells them to learn except for unschooled children who just keep on playing all the way through the school years. And sometime here around 17 to maybe 25, 
Children want to know more. They may decide they're going into a career and they want to get a more formal education and then they go pick up the courses they need to get on to post-secondary. And that's what unschooling is like. When you look at the ways people learn today, they learn through many places and people. School is only one way to learn reading, writing, and arithmetic. And you're a veteran home educator already. You have been teaching your child or facilitating their learning since birth. You absolutely can continue facilitating their curiosity, their love for learning all the way through to the teen years. So when parents look at education, it's usually through a continuum. When you look, they start off sending their children to school because 95% of parents, that's what we've always did. We did that, we do it to our kids. And then somehow school doesn't work much anymore. So what parents do is distance education, which is still school controlled, but now in the home. And that's what COVID education has been about, is distance education. So education is no longer where it takes place. It's a matter of who controls it. So it's still school controlled here. And then parents gain more confidence in their children's ability to learn and their ability to facilitate or teach. And then they go to home education and they may use a prepackaged curriculum or, or a parent-made curriculum, but they get to control all the decisions. And then when they become confident in their children's ability to teach themselves, they may choose self-directed education or unschooling. And they notice their curious learners choose everything. And the future can be a hybrid of all of these. Unschoolers may want a classroom for certain subjects. My kids wanted to learn welding, which is something we couldn't really do at home. So a classroom was the best place. But for physics, they wanted to teach themselves through a textbook. For food studies, I wanted to teach them. So the best scenario in the future is a combination of all of these according to what the learner needs. Students now are borderless. They can learn from any course or resources anywhere in the world. And the future is about proving qualifications. Boundaries and regulation become less important because they are borderless. So when you bring your children home to homeschool, you become the general contractor of their education. But that doesn't mean you have to teach. You are like a home renovator. You contract out certain parts. You can hire tutors. You can use a co-op with other parents. You can hire your child care professional to teach. It can be student-led like unschooling or your children can pick from any online courses all over the world. How do they prove what they've learned? They write exams. So Basically, there's three ways to get an education. There's school control, parent control, and learner controlled. Unschooling is, in a nutshell, freedom to learn, a philosophy and lifestyle of educational freedom in which a child's natural curiosity and motivation, nurtured in a rich and stimulating environment, will lead the child to learn what he or she needs to know in the time frame he or she needs it. So it's like offering a child a buffet table of foods and the child's standing there with their empty plate and they decide what to put on that plate. Quantity, maybe a little more of the chocolate cake instead of the broccoli, whatever they decide, they get to fill their plate. And that's what unschooling is. Generally, it's called unschooling at home, but in a school, it's called self-directed education. But either way, the learners choose not only the pace of what they learn, but the content, the resources, the method, the scope, and the sequence. 
there are many benefits to this methodology called unschooling. And that's what it is. It's a methodology of homeschooling. Um, but I can't go through them all <laughs> within the time limits we have. But there's 61 benefits listed in the book, Unschooling to University. Here are some of the advantages. Motivation is never a problem. The child's always developmentally ready for the material because they go at their own pace and they understand rather than memorize. They develop independence and responsibility. They learn how to learn. Their absorption is high because they're interested and there are no power struggles in getting kids to learn or do the work. Learning is loved for its intrinsic value and it stimulates creativity, initiative, decision making, and problem solving. All learning styles are covered and learners are exposed to diversity in the community. Okay, there's a few disadvantages too. Sometimes a child's interest erupts at inconvenient times like bedtime. <laughs> Cost may be a barrier. A welding class was pretty pricey. And learning is difficult to measure because it's invisible. If you don't force your children to do output, which you can measure their knowledge, then it's very hard to assure yourself that they're learning. And we treasure what we measure. So it's very difficult for parents and also for the education industry. It requires a lot of trust that children are born learning and continue to learn for their whole lifetime. So you may ask yourself, well, if this is so great, why have I not heard of this before? Well, it boils down to money. Unschooling doesn't make anybody any money. In fact, it disrupts a billion dollar industry called school and education. Yes, okay, our story. So I had five kids and we started off in school because my partner didn't agree with homeschooling. And the schools in our area looked a lot nicer than the schools he was used to in England. So we put our kids in school. And for various reasons from special needs, learning disabilities, intelligence levels, their learning needs were not met in the system. So we decided, let's homeschool. I'm sure we can't do any worse. So we became homeschoolers, but I'm a non-punitive person. And by November, my children weren't listening to me anymore <laughs> because I'm safe. As you can see, this, they wrote on our math book, I hate mathematics. <laughs> Well, he didn't hate mathematics too long because he became an engineer. But our role slowly transitioned from teacher to facilitator. So more and more, we became homeschoolers that never got around to homeschooling. We ditched the workbooks. We ditched the textbooks. We went on field trips. We did art. We had fun. And a lot of our fun looked like play because it was play. The kids played for 10 years that other children spend in school. We had so much fun. And it fit very well with the way adults learn. So again, my background is I teach adults. I'm an adult um, facilitator. And adults are very self-directed. But we don't extend the same um, privilege to children. Children are what we view as dependent learners, and we make them that way, where adults are increasingly independent learners. So the, the philosophy of self-directed education is not so much divided between ages, children and adults, but how people learn. So I really loved it. 
When our children did a self-directed high school, they wrote 21 of our grade 12 exams. They got an average of 78%, where our provincial average is 65%. They got scholarships and they went on to universities. Four of the kids were accepted to universities and three in STEM programs, which is science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Three have graduated so far. We have one master's student and they applied to 10 Canadian universities, all in the McLean's school rankings. And as they started heading off to post-secondary, we noticed a lot of my um, friends as unschooled children and their unschooled friends went off to post-secondaries too. And I looked around and thought, this needs to be a book because nobody knows about this. So do children need 16 years of formal education when you count in preschool too? Absolutely not. And yet the worldwide trend is going earlier schooling, longer schooling, and more academic schooling. And to me, that's the wrong direction. That doesn't give kids 16 years of formal education. It gives them an early burnout. Children of all ages need more play. And the research supports that. Um, big research here is the free schools of Sudbury Valley, Summerhill, and all the free schools that have grown worldwide. Oops. The Fraser Institute has done two very good reports, not necessarily on unschooling, but definitely on homeschooling. One, in North America and one focused more on Canada and they found that home education is growing um, exponentially. They also found that homeschoolers outperform both public and private students academically. There's no advantage if parents are certified teachers. It eliminates all socioeconomic status effects. Students are involved in eight social activities outside the home and they have scored high life satisfaction. Families spend less than $4,000 per household, never mind per child, when the average student in public school costs $11,000 for taxpayer funding. And the primary models of behavior are adults rather than peers. Dr. Peter Gray did a survey of 75 unschoolers. He found that the more structured the children had in their education, such as homeschooling or public school, the less likely they were to go on to post-secondary. So the least structured education children had, the more likely they would be to go on to post-secondary. And I have found that too, anecdotally, but it's like children burn out when they hit junior high, high school, where those who have never had a formal program gear up. And those are the years that count. So in my book, I cover the survey of the 30 friends that went on to post-secondaries. Less than half of 30 went to preschool and they unschooled anywhere from three to 12 school years. All were accepted to colleges, university and tech schools. 22 of the 30 have already graduated in Canada and two have gone on to masters. The, the research is out there. Children need more adults and more play. According to Dr. Peter Gray, Dr. Gordon Neufeld, Pat Ferenga, and Sir Ken Robinson. So let's kind of look at brain development. When children are born, they have 100 billion neurons that for the most part aren't connected to each other and they connect by sending neurotransmitters across that gap between them when children experience things and learn. So by age seven, children have a whole lot of brain pathways and the brain prunes them by age 15, strengthening the pathways that are used the most often. And that's the reason why you can't remember those French lessons you learned in grade four, because if you didn't keep up French, your brain's gonna prune those pathways. 
So most learning stimulates neurons, but video games does the same thing too. So children develop in four concepts, physical, cognitive, social, and emotional. And the brain develops from the bottom to the top and from the back to the front. So when we say lower brain parts, the lower brain um, organs are the ones that keep the motor skills, the, the heart, the lungs functioning. The upper brain functions are more the thinking ones. And the prefrontal brain functions are what comes in puberty. So babies, hindbrain, midbrain, bottom brain functions most sensitive. Toddlers getting more to the midbrain um, is where they they're become super curious and love to explore, but without that caution that comes with more brain growth. Um, older toddlers, same thing. Preschoolers, more the back of the brain functions of the parietal lobe. And as you can see here, this is why children usually don't start school until age six, is when they have more of that mid-brain prefrontal cortex brain development. So from birth to three, not a whole lot of brain development there. But from three to six, they're really taking a big leap. And that second big leap is from 13 to 25. When that big jump there is around age 18. And most unschoolers have noticed that around age 17, 18, those kids are noticing their friends are going on, planning their careers, planning their life. That's when they start buckling down and wanting to do more academic activity that will get them to where they want to go. So, um, School agers, so again, more of the midbrain up here. And age 13, the beginning of puberty, is when a lot of children can switch from experiential learning to paper learning, especially in math. Um, these are common things in math that children learn through play. And more things they can learn through play. I remember they learned Roman numerals through reading Asterix and Obelix books. And then about age 13, then they start getting those abstract concepts. And that's when they're willing to do more book work. And can they start math in grade eight? Yes, because they're not starting at grade one level math. They can cover from grade one to grade eight levels in one year not because um, of school, it's because the brain is ready to accept abstract concepts very easily. It's like toilet training. You can take months and months and months when you're doing it when they're two, or you can take one day when they're four because they're ready. And that is a golden age. When this frontal lobe starts developing, children get it. They can understand concepts very quickly. Okay, I'm going to skip a lot of these. Okay, what is unschooling? As I said, it's knowledge acquired on a need-to-know time frame as determined by the learner. So, usually three things are needed, a facilitator, resources, and unstructured time. That's it. And resources can be as basic as a library card and the internet. What do kids do all day? These are some things they do and they learn through. A lot of people ask, well, what about music? I was forced to play piano when I was a child and I'm really glad I did because now I can play piano. That may be true, but everybody can start lessons when they're around late teens, early adulthood, in music and in language. Sure, that's not the optimum time to start, but it's the time when children are motivated. 
I've actually seen that in my five kids, is that when they really wanted to learn languages, for example, they were going to do a work term in Germany, that's when they really were motivated and they learned to a proficient level. Um, was it harder work? Yes, it was. It would have been a lot easier if they started at age two or age five and did immersion and kept it up. But if they didn't keep it up, they would have lost it anyways. So just like languages and music, they, young adults, can learn to a proficient level when they want to. Motivation is the key. So what is unschooling? Let's talk about what it isn't. It's not homeschooling. Homeschooling tends to be parent teaches. So unschooling is no instruction unless the learner wants it, okay? Although unschooling is a methodology under homeschooling and is governed by homeschooling regulations. Unschooling is not permissive. A parent or adult acts as an attentive mentor or facilitator that provides resources. Permissiveness is inattentive neglect. It's not well researched yet. Most unschoolers detest the whole idea of standardized testing because like teachers do, we know that testing does not assess the full range of intelligences and capabilities of the whole learner. The measurement of how unschoolers compare to schoolers is pretty well unstudied. And unschooling is not uneducated. Children who unschool learn as much or more as children in structured learning environments, and they get to go deep rather than wide. The learning stick because they're intrinsically motivated. So how just offer plenty of time and have Take some places, <laughs> live your life, have some resources, have books, have things, have the internet, have things around that they can access. Um, and this was a difference with Tara Westover, the author of Educated. She was kept in the dark. She did not have a lot of these resources around that she could um, access and, and open up windows for her. Okay, so like I said, students are borderless and self-directed education is growing worldwide. It's growing in the home in terms of unschooling, it's growing in schools in terms of inquiry-based learning, and it's growing in preschools. And it's, the problem is, it's basically play and parents doubt play. But play is one of the UN rights of the child. Okay, I'm not going to talk too much about play other than children do not get enough play in their childhood these days. The time they're allowed free play has dropped and over the same period we've seen an increase in depression, anxiety, suicide and um, just not good mental health. Children need play. And unfortunately in the system the way it's set up is the number one concern of children in the system is funding, whereas the number one concern of children when you homeschool and unschool is the child's best interest. And that will always make it good to consider homeschooling or unschooling. Okay, I'm not, what does a facilitator do? Um, they show how to access resources if they need it. They ask questions or answer questions. You can offer resources, but don't impose them. You can model curiosity. You can observe your child and help them make connections. You can allow those kids to be bored. Yes. And help them take time for their interests. And when you're feeling shaky, get your support. Okay, common concerns, let's talk about this. Um, societal myths, learners need teachers more than facilitators, no. Children need adults to occupy their time, no. There are educational resources and junk resources, no. 
everything's educational. <laughs> Learning and socialization can only occur in school? No. Play is frivolous and time-wasting? No, play is productive. Early education and more of it is good? No. Kids won't learn work ethic if not trained early? No, when they need to, they do it, especially with that development of the executive function. When they need to get something done, they will put their video games on hold and go do it. And lastly, kids won't learn basics. No, they absolutely, every child learns reading, writing, and arithmetic on their own without instruction. Absolutely. Kids have too much power. They already own the power, whether they're going to learn or not learn. Will there be gaps? Yes. You can't stop a child from learning and you can't make a child learn. And there will be gaps because your child can't learn everything in the world, but your child that goes to school can't learn everything in the world either. So <laughs> even schools pick and choose what they're going to teach. Here's just some examples. These were our outcomes for our school system. And this is how you can meet them by play, by playing Settlers of Catan, or Minecraft, or Lego. Educational. There is not educational Lego and non-educational Lego. Sorry. <laughs> how do kids learn math? Math is about solving problems in everyday life. And too often we teach kids the tools for solving problems before they even get to the problems, where it's better to encounter a problem and then teach them the tool to solve it if they want to know, or they could look it up. Our cheesecake is an example where we ordered half a cheesecake, took it out of the box for this birthday party and looked at it and thought, that's not half a cheesecake. So it was a good lesson on pie. <laughs> what about reading? Every child learns to read on their own developmental progression. It just so happens that seven, six, seven is the average age the brain development makes reading happen. And most children are in school. So there's the propaganda is that we say, well, they learned to read in school. Well, it's just because they happen to be in school when it happens. Same as toilet training. Every child learns to read because we live in a literate society and you can't escape reading or words. What about science and social? Science and social are value laden subjects. So once children know how to read, and they can write, they can learn any topics they want about science and social. And social studies is best learned through travel, through museums, through um, art galleries, through visiting places. Cheap travel through world schooling and Airbnbs, what I call independent travel, is so educational. This is my son visiting Dachau, the concentration camp in Munich. And science is all about exploring and making mistakes and experimentation. You can't learn science from a textbook. You have to learn it through actual properties that you engage with every day. So a question is, isn't that giving too much power to a child to determine their education? But we forget that children in school who don't want to learn, they act out. Teenagers in school that don't want to learn, tune out. And young adults in school that don't want to learn, drop out. Children own their education. We're just handing over the power to empower them earlier because they learn. Will my child be socialized? Of course. Forced so association is not socialization. And social skills is more than finding friends. It's learning how to be a decent member of society. And the best way to do that is with peers and lots of adults around. Can parents work while you homeschool or unschool? Absolutely. 
if you're the general contractor of your child's education, you can outsource a lot of it. If your child is neurodiverse, would unschooling work? Absolutely. Even better than forcing them to learn curriculum. They want to learn what they want to learn. There's no motivation problems, and they're going to soak in what they need to know a lot more than if you force it. Okay, what about university? Now there's 14 ways to get in. I'm gonna cover just the three main ones. For most university programs, you don't need a diploma. Well, your child doesn't need a diploma. <laughs> what they need are five grade 12 subjects, generally speaking. Math, English, science, social studies, maybe an option. And children, if they, for example, want to go into medicine, they're gonna need a science degree first. To get into that science degree program, they're going to need those five grade 12 subjects. So about age 15, 16, they, that's what they wanna do. They're more motivated to pick up a math book and start working through it, or a biology book and start working through it. Then they can write the SATs, the grade 12 exams, and prove their qualifications. But they're motivated, they can do it. So one, a lot of um, parents in the US do a parent-issued transcript. Um, a lot can do a government issue transcript for self-taught courses. Many do a diploma or SAT exam challenge. And that's probably one of the easiest ways to do it is to challenge college acceptance exams and you're on your way. Um, another way is to go to the community colleges, do a year, get good marks, become a transfer student to any institution. Another way is through university in-house upgrading. Maybe the child wants to go um, upgrade their grade 12 subjects at a university, or they can apply with mature student status, but they have to be a certain age to do that. Those are common ways that unschoolers get into university or colleges. Question is, what if they play video games all day? Well, <laughs> video games teach cooperation, commitment, teamwork, critical thinking, problem solving, creativity, and innovation. And they stimulate brain cells just as much as mathematics does. Again, right? Um, and again, about that age of 17 around here is when children start looking at what they want to do and putting some effort into what they're going to do for their career the rest of their lives. Now, maybe that won't hit until age 27 or 30 or maybe 35, but generally it's around this, the, the peak of the executive function development of self-control, planning, decision-making. Okay, so there's a lot of unschoolers who limit screen time there's a lot of unschoolers who don't um, and all their kids turn out fine um, i always tend to say that there needs to be balance that's my parent educator part coming out <laughs> is balance um, and having you know times for screen and times for family or times for physical activity okay so every family has to get to that okay so we've I think we've reached our time. Can play replace school? You bet it can. Absolutely play can teach children everything they need to know for what they want to do. And I'm going to end with this poem, which I absolutely love. Um, it's called Play. And I don't know who wrote it, but it's kind of nice. So. Okay, I tried to teach my child with words. They often passed him by unheard. I tried to teach my child with books. He only gave me puzzled looks. Despairingly, I turned aside. 
how can I teach this child? I cried. Into my hand, he placed the key. Come, he said, and play with me. Isn't that cute? That is so what children want to do. They want to play. So um, I'm going to open it up to questions now. Um, if you'd like to purchase the book, um, this is the content. So it's divided into four parts. First part is what is unschooling? Second part is why, and that's those 61 benefits in six chapters there. Third part is how. So we go into detail on um, what does the adult do? What are resources? How, what do they do with their time? How do you handle the assessment component of home education regulation? And then the last part is the big one. It goes through those brain development stages. So I go into very detailed of what children need during those ages, what their brains are doing, and different issues. So for example, um, junior high tends to be online learning, what to look for, high school, what, what would a child need on a transcript if they were going to go on to post-secondary. So feel free. Um, if you want to send me, e-transfer me $30, send it to my email at journal at shaw.ca. If you're in North America, I can offer you free shipping. So um, that saves Amazon's part. <laughs> but if you're outside North America, that would take the whole shipping. <laughs> Sorry about that. Feel free to keep in touch with me. You can access my blog. So a lot of what's not in the book, which is um, anecdotes and Thoughts is at our blog, Unschooling to University. And we have a Facebook group. Um, find me on Facebook, Unschooling to University. We have a page. I have a group called Unschooling STEM, S T E M. Um, also, you can order it from Amazon if you want, or find me at professionalparenting.ca where I teach a lot of courses. So, thank you so much for coming if you're leaving us now. Um, so I would like to feel free to write your question in the chat box. Okay. And I'm going to say goodbye and turn off my video. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Okay. The question is, what about all the research on the negative effects of screen time? Um, there are professionals that talk about the danger of forming an attachment to a device rather than people. And I think the key there is device rather than people. Can children not form an attachment to both? Parents, family, friends, and to the device. And that's what most normal, healthy kids are doing now. They're not choosing one over the other. They're choosing both. Um, the recent brain research shows that in normal, healthy families where there's not toxic stress and there are low adverse childhood experiences, that addiction is not going to happen. Yes, screen time is compelling, but addiction is a function of brain impairment. And in a normal, healthy family that nurture each other and talk to each other, those brains are not going to be impaired because there is low toxic stress and low ACEs. So, <laughs> so if your children spend too much time on screens, they're going to grow out of it. It's not going to cause lifetime harm or brain damage. Keep up conversing with them, keep up um, physical activity, and they will be okay. Okay, another question. How did you set your mind at ease around your late readers? Do you, f okay. Okay, so yes, I had late readers. Um, one child read at eight, one child read at five, one child read at four, the English major, <laughs> one child read at nine, 
and one child read at 10. And um, all my kids were overdue too, so I should have expected it. But um, <laughs> their late reading is not a problem. Um, if you take them out of a school environment and you don't make a big deal about it. So we didn't assign grades to our kids. My daughter in typical grade eight, someone would ask her what grade she is and she'd say, I'm level 80 Hunter, because she was playing World of Warcraft at that time. <laughs> so if you don't make a big deal about it, they won't feel they're inadequate and it will come. Um, I don't have the picture in this presentation, but I should put it in. Um, when my late readers started reading, within a year, they were reading novels. They were reading the Warrior series, the Redwall novels, and those are two inch thick books. They were reading Lord of the Rings. So it's not practice they need, it clicks. And we just have to wait for it to happen. That's not to say that you can't love books and share books and and um, make reading a love, fun, cuddly time with them. And we, every night we'd have reading time and we read books to the kids even through the teen years because it was just a fun thing to do. We'd go to the library every Monday, come home with a whole whack of books and everyone would go into their little reading corner. And those are things we did to counteract screen time, right? So um, if you have, a home with books and you read and you love read and you model reading, your children are going to read. It's going to just tell the naysayers, don't worry. Um, another question, do you feel like you succeeded because your kids attended post-secondary? Um, there are many unschooled kids who don't attend post-secondary. Absolutely. My problem was when I wrote the book, I needed a benchmark that was non- Quibble. So, because <laughs> um, people treasure what they can measure. So, my benchmark was did your child apply to post secondary and did they get in? Were they accepted? And no one can argue with that. Relatives can't argue with that, right? So, um, yes, there are many unschooled children who don't go to post secondary, who start businesses, who um, excel in the workplace, who are entrepreneurs and they're artists, they do very well and they're very successful too. And what I needed was to see a book that focused on kids in STEM. So 10 of our 30 kids were in, went on to STEM careers. And I think that is what is very um, important to people right now. A lot of people are really worried about, they want their kids to go into STEM, and I wanted to assure them that unschoolers do go into STEM careers too. We even had four engineers of those 10 kids. So, um, yeah, so that was kind of where I was going with that. But children who are happy in their careers and have excellent relationships and are decent people are what I call successful. Um, whether they go on to post-secondary, whether they finish post-secondary is not an indication of success in my books, but I am writing to a certain um, segment of the population. Okay, another question. Unschooling a child who is used to traditional learning, how to change the pace and fight initial boredom. I'm not sure you can fight the initial boredom. I think you can let them be bored. Um, they say it takes about a month of de-schooling in order per year a child was in school. So if a child you pull out in grade eight, they've been in school eight years, give them eight months to start becoming bored. <laughs> and if they spend all that time on video games or YouTube, they are going to get to the point where they get bored of watching TikTok all day. They will, and they will pick up something that is looks a bit more educational to us. We have to trust the process, and that's gonna be the hardest thing you do. 
get support. Get on a unschooling Facebook group because I need that did that support when my kids did nothing that looked like traditional learning. Nothing. But also observe your child when they pick up a tidbit of information or they try something. Write those things down because those things, or take a picture of it, because those things are what can assure you that, yes, they're learning. Things are percolating in that brain of theirs. They're thinking about the world and their place in it, and they're figuring out how to put things together. And absolutely, have things lying around. I have board games out. Um, if the child's looking like they're bored, I will pull out art supplies. Whether they do anything with them or not, doesn't matter. Um, they watched, they got their whole elementary science through watching magic school bus videos. So don't worry, it will come. Sometimes, yeah, kids don't ask for things they need. They, they behave badly. <laughs> So they can be just whiny and bored and, and they want connection. They want you. So the best thing to do is offer to do something with them. Maybe go for a walk if you can. Get into the kitchen and bake cookies. Um, I found that too when I wanted to pull my kids off screens. A good way to do that was say, come do this with me. And very often they would right? Um, for example, today we just went for a bike ride. My kids are 18 to 28 and we said, let's go for a bike ride this afternoon. It's really nice out before the webinar I have to do tonight. And we did. And if they're, if you're going to do it with them, they won't give up that opportunity to be with you because kids love to be with parents and family. They really do. And they certainly do in the teen years too. Um, we went through our teen years with absolutely no punishment. Um, that's not to say that teens didn't make mistakes and mess up once in a while, but we helped them through it. We showed them how to problem solve, help them problem solve, fix things, make it better. And our relationship is so amazing. If you're not punishing kids to do homework or schoolwork or things like that, you don't need punishment in your relationship. You can have an amazing relationship where you, you help them and they help you. And the teen years are the best. They're absolutely the best. Okay, I think that's it for questions. So um, I just wanna say thanks again everybody for coming and um i hope to do this in a couple months again and if you have more questions and feel free to come again and thank you so much for joining us tonight and um take care and i hope um if you want the book feel free to email me e-transfer me 30 dollars flat rate i will send it out to you absolutely okay so thanks a lot and good night